<clears throat> it's really an honor <clears throat> and a pleasure to be here tonight. When you hear that there's a group of women in Klal Yisrael living in Los Angeles, California, that are saying Nishmat every single day, and having the names of all the young women that need Shaduchim in mind, when you when you carry the burden of others on your own heart and in your own mind and in your own soul, the Gemara tells us that kolam is anyone who davens for their friend, and they need the same exact thing. is going to answer them first. When you so badly need what your other friend needs, meaning that you feel their pain, you feel their need, you understand what it means not to have the shidduch that you're looking for yet, so who never techila, you will be answered first, meaning your prayers, even for that person, can be answered before the own person's prayers for themselves. So this is a very holy crowd that is here tonight. And it's a zechus for me to be here. Thank you, Mrs. Gabai, for inviting me. It's very something very special that you have created. And to the Lullaby family, thank you for opening up your doors once again for Kiddushah and for Simcha and Bracha. May your house always be a Bayit Ne'eman be Yisrael that is filled with the words of Torah, and we should hear the breaking of glass, not from the beautiful things in your kitchen here, but the breaking of glass by the chuppah for your children, Bezat Hashem. There is a famous story that goes all the way back to the early days of Yerushalayim, I believe probably the 1920s and 30s, the briska rub at the time was Rabbi Yeshua Leib Diskin. <coughs> And he was once officiating by a chatuna, by a wedding. And the chassan and kala, the bride and the groom, they went to the chuppah. And it came time to put the ring on the finger of the bride. And so the young man, you could imagine, he was trembling, he was shaking, a little bit nervous. The great, great tzaddik, the briskarov, was the masada kedushin. His kala, I'm sure, came from a very fine family in Jerusalem. And he's going to put the ring on the finger, Hariyat Mekudesh Moshe Yisrael. And she sticks out her finger and he puts the ring on and it falls off. So the crowd gasps. And the brisker Rav said, It's okay, it's okay. Pick up the ring. He picked up the ring. He told them, say it again. She sticks out her finger. He puts on the ring, and it falls off a second time. You know, if this was a Persian wedding, that's it. That's it, the end. Too much, too much bad omens over there. They call in Rabbi Nathan Eli, and that's it. It's over at that point. <laughs> but it was an Ashkenazi chasama. And so the briskerov said, it's okay pick up the ring and put it back onto her finger. And he picks up the ring and she sticks out her finger, he puts it on and it falls off a third time. And this time the briska Rav looks at the Chatan Vekalan, he says, we're going to take a short intermission in the chuppah. Let's just take a break. And so everybody in the crowd is watching what is going on over here. Ring falls off three times. Could there be a worse sign than that? And now the brisker Rav is saying, take a break. What does he have in mind? About 15 minutes goes by, they ate the sushi and they had the meat that was cut so nicely. And then the brisker Rav says, okay, chuppah, chuppah, chuppah. And they call back the chassan and the kala. And he says, take the ring. Hariyat Mekudeshedli, he says, she puts out her finger, he puts on the ring, and it stays on. Mazel tov. 
Everybody's mazel tov, singing, wow, amazing. They came to the briska rub afterwards, they said, how did you know? How did you know you waited? What did you wait for? He said, we say by every shidduch, b'sha'a tova u'matzlachat. There is a good and an auspicious time when the shidduch is going to come. If the ring fell off of her finger three times, it means it was not yet the sha'a tova u'matzlachat. I waited for the sha'a tova. Everyone that is sitting in this room, the, the girls that are dating, and the mothers that want so badly that their daughters should become kalot, or their sons, chatanim, you should know that HaKadosh Baruch has a Shah tova, he has a good time. Umat lachat, and the bright time, with success, with auspicious, with bracha. And at that time, whether you said Nishmat 700 times, or you said it only seven psukim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows exactly the right time for every single one of you. You have nothing at all to worry about. And that's what the Midrash tells us. Famous words. Quotes a Pasuk in Tehillim. Eloikim Moishiv Yechidim Baisa. Hashem brings Yechidim individuals and He settles them together Baisa in a house. Says the Midrash, Matroina Shaales Rabbi Yosef Achalafta. There was once a noble, a noble woman from Rome, and she met the great sage Rabbi Yosef Achalafta. Amrulai, she said, Lekama Yomim Bara Kodesh Baruch Esoylomai. How long did it take Hashem to create the world? Amrulai said, Lesheshes Yomim. It took only six days, like it says in the Pasuk. Ki sheishes yamim asa Hashem 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 made the world in six days. So Amrullah, she asked him back. Okay, so it's now thousands of years since he created the world. So Amrullah, So what's Hashem doing for the last 3,000 years? It took six days to create the world. He made the world perfect, everything looks great. So what's HaKadosh Baruch Hu doing for the last thousands and thousands of years? What's he playing? Chess? Sheshbesh? What are they playing up there in Shemaim? What's he doing over there? Says the, says the Midrash, Armalai says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yoshef, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sitting, Umizavig Zivugim, and he is making Shiduchim. Bito shall plaini la plaini, the daughter of this man is going to marry that man over there. Ishto shall plaini la plaini, the woman of this one will marry that man over there. He's very busy. Have you seen, have you heard about the Shidduch crisis? He, she said, There's a lot of Shidduchim to make. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is busy day and night being mezavig, zivugim, bringing couples together. So she said, how hard could it be to make a shidduch? They have all these symposiums, they have all the women come together, they go through all of the resumes, they look at the pictures, the ones they don't like, they throw that way, the ones they do like, they keep over here. How hard could it be to make a good shidduch? You know what? I have a thousand slaves men, and a thousand slave women, I'll make a thousand shidduchim tonight. You'll see it's not so hard. So she lines them all up in a row, 1,000 this way, 1,000 that way, and she says, you marry him, you marry him, you marry him. In the morning, the Midrash tells us, one slave comes with a broken arm, and the other one comes with a broken leg, and the other one comes with a, with a <laughs> cut on his head, that's all from the same wife, by the way. That was a joke. <laughs> I know the Sfardim know nothing about violence, Baruch Hashem. It's just a joke. So they all come and they've got, they got split heads, they have eyes popped out, broken arms. She says, what's going on over here? And each one says, you think I want to marry that person? You think I want to marry that one? 
And she comes back to Rabbi Yoshua Bar Chalafna and she tells Rabbi Yosef Bar Chalafna, she says, Ein Eloikai, there's no God in the world like your God. He's the only one that knows how to make the Shaduchim for Klal Yisrael. He's busy going like this and like this. This one over here, this one over here, this one over here, this one over here. We can't do it on our own. Says the Midrash, are you worrying? Because the Shadchan from Lakewood didn't call you in six months already. Are you worrying because they just had a Shadchan meeting in Pico Robertson and you were sure they told you your resume is on the top of the pile and nobody called you yet? Are you getting nervous because your daughter went out one time and two times and three times? And you know those rotten boys in yeshiva? You know they call after like six times and they just say, ah, it's not going to work. Why not? It's just not going to work. And he doesn't have the decency to call the girl. He doesn't have the guts to go on one more date and tell her in person, it's not going to work. He tells the shachan, and the shachan tells her husband, and the husband tells his rebbe, and the rebbe pulls him to the side and she even says, you know, whatever, it's not going to work. Says the midrash, you have nothing at all to worry about. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is busy all day long working on your shidduch. Do you know what it takes to make a shidduch? Anyone that is married over here, think to yourself, if you would think of your whole life, and the whole life of your husband, and how the two of you ended up meeting together as one, and then living together as one for so many years, happily, well, happily, if you would think about all of the different details that HaKadosh Baruch had to do all of the time, you would realize what a miracle every single shidduch in Klal Yisrael is. Says the Midrash, you that are looking for a shidduch, you should know HaKadosh Baruch Hu, He is looking for your shidduch before you were even born. Before you came into the world, before you knew what shidduchim were. Before you had all the stories they told you in Beis Yaakov of what you should be looking for. And then you went to seminary and they reinforced all of the opinions of what it means to be an Eshet Chayol and the kind of boy that you're looking for. HaKadosh Baruch Hu had it all figured out beforehand. And your Chatan is somewhere around the corner. I, you don't know who he is yet? You didn't hear his name yet? You didn't get the resume yet? Don't worry. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is busy being mezavig, zivugim. He's putting it all together. As she said, there is no God like the God of Klal Yisrael. Eina leikei kelokei Yisrael. Because He is taking care of each and of every one of us. So we're supposed to speak tonight about Shidduchim. That's what I understand. And I understand that there's a lot of different things that perhaps we are supposed to try to speak about to understand exactly what the world of Shaduchim is about. We'll start with our Amunah, and that is that HaKadosh Baruch is running the world and you have nothing at all to worry about. But if you want to get practical because we should understand what Hashem is really looking for, for us, and what he's asking of us, and what we ourselves need to be thinking of, we'll try to get practical as well. There's a famous Maisa with Rav Chaim Kanievsky. A man was called an altar bacher, which means in English he was getting older. 35 years old, didn't have a shidduch. He comes to the great Sadiq Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and he says, Rebbe, I'm 35 years old. I went out with who knows, hundreds of girls. I cannot find the right one. So Chaim Kanievsky looks at the man and he says, don't worry, she wasn't born yet. Uh, Rebbe, I'm 35 years old. If she wasn't born yet, I'm in big trouble. He says, Altidat, don't worry, she wasn't born yet. The guy walks out of Chaim Kanievsky's private chambers, more confused and more depressed than he was when he walked in. 
What is he talking about? My wife wasn't born yet. I'm 35 years old. I'm going to marry a child. What's going on over here? A year later or so, he comes back to Avchan Kanievsky with his kala and he says, Rebbe, we get a mazel tov. This is the kala that you premonitioned about that I'm going to have. What was the story? When I walked into your house last year and you told me she's not born yet, my wife was in the middle of, converse, of conver, uh, converting. And she was not yet a Jew. And the Gemara tells us that every single convert is like a brand new child that is born. After I came here and I got the bracha from you, what happened? She converted. So Shitaka was born really after you gave me the bracha. That means that whether your shidduch is waiting for you in Los Angeles or in New York or in Baltimore or somewhere, don't worry. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has him already prepared and he's going to come to you exactly at the right time. But let's try to make it a little bit more practical so that we can understand. The, Mish- the Mishnah Pekiyavah says over the following, Rabbi Yaakov Oymer HaOyelom Hazer Doyim So this world is like an entranceway, a corridor. Bivnei Olam Haba before the world to come. Haskein Atzmecha B'Proizdor Fix yourself up in the Proizdor, in the corridor. Kidei Shiti Kanes the Chaklin that you can enter into the palace, into the chambers of the Rebbein Shem and sit by his royal throne. This world is just a corridor. It's not the main part. You want to get to the palace. You want to get to the king. You want to see him on his throne. Haskein Atzmecha Fix yourself up before you go in there. Says Rashi the following words. What does it mean to fix yourself up for the king? And he says, Somebody who wants to go and stand before the king. Misakin Rashi fixes his hair. Uzakana, he makes sure that his beard looks good. Umechava Mabusha, he makes sure that there's no dust on his clothing, no stains, nothing like that. While he's standing in the chatzah, while he's standing in the courtyard waiting to go to the king. So too says Rashi, Tzarech kol adam l'sakin atzma ba'ilam haze, a person must fix themselves up in this world. There he's talking about tshuva ma'isim toivim, with good deeds and the like, in order that you're ready to go and greet Hashem. What does the Mishnah mean? The Mishnah means that before that you are about to go meet the king, before you are going somewhere that is chashuv, that is important, a person has to make sure that they are fixing themselves up so that they look their best and they are their best when they're going to stand before the king. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu is delaying somebody's shidduch, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is taking his time before you're going to meet Mr. Right, the right one, you should take it as an opportunity in your life. Haskein atzmecha. Begin to fix yourself up and get yourself ready for the rest of your life. I heard once many years ago of Rav Noach Orlowicht. He said many people think that marriage is a solution to all of their problems. He said, I'm sorry to tell you it will actually only make all of your problems much, much worse. And rather, haskin atzmecha. Get yourself ready. Prepare yourself now. Fix yourself up. See what you need to do so that you will be the best wife, the best Ezer Kenegdoi, the best helpmate for your husband when you're going to meet him to make sure that you are ready to be the perfect Eshet Chayim. So what do we need to do to get ourselves ready for the enjoyment of marriage and the schos, the zechot, of being an Eshet Chayim? So I would like to suggest perhaps a few things. Number one, many of the young ladies that are dating right now, Baruch Hashem, You have wonderful role models in your life. You have fathers that are such good people. 
Whether they are mechanchim, whether they are teaching, whether they are rebbeim, whether they are good <laughs> balabatim who wake up early in the morning and they go to pray shacharit early and then they learn and they go to work. They're honest in their business. They come home, they spend time with the children, they do some homework, they go back and learn again at night. Such good role models. You went to the finest of schools. You had some of the best rebbeim that you could imagine in Los Angeles, menalim that showed you what B'nai Torah are all about, then you went to seminary, and you saw your great teachers in seminary, and you went around to people's homes for Shabbat, and you saw beautiful, beautiful families. So you have in your mind an image of what the perfect husband is going to look like. And then the perfect husband that you paid $783 for a trip last minute to Lakewood, and you have to fly all the way by yourself, and he does not offer to pick you up at the airport. No, he's, he's busy learning. He's, that's why he can't come to Los Angeles like a man. She's very busy. He's busy, busy, busy. So you fly all there by yourself. Some of you are lucky you have family in Lakewood. Some of you don't have family in Lakewood, so you stay by a girl that just got married like three days ago, and she opens up her guest room to you. She's actually two years younger than you also, so that really makes it even worse. And then this boy shows up on the first date. He comes 20 minutes late. That's strike number one. Then you notice that his tie is like all the way down to here. And he didn't shave completely either. And his hat is dusty. And his shoes are scuffed. And then you notice that he doesn't know how to really speak English so well. Not because he's Persian, it's because he's yeshivish. And yeshivish bachrim don't speak English, they speak yeshivish. Now if you're a good Persian girl from Los Angeles, you don't understand yeshivish. So he's talking the whole night, and you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he's saying, you understand? You understand? And you have no idea what the guy is talking about. And then he drops you off, and he doesn't get out of the car, and he slows down just enough that you can get out without having to jump out and fall onto the ground. And he says, we'll talk to the shachar, okay? And he drives off. And you say to yourself, this is the perfect husband that I'm looking for? This is the tzaddik Yisrael Oilam that they told me about in Beis Yaakov. You're going to be Moisa Nefesh. You'll get three jobs. You'll have all the kids with you at work and you'll take care of everything. So that you can date and marry such a tzaddik like this? What happened to your great rebellion? What happened to the father, the image? What about one of your older brothers who's like the biggest tzaddik in the world or a cousin or uncle or something like that? Who is this guy? Who is this young guy? The answer is, he is a young, unpolished gem. And you should not expect that the guy that you flew into Lakewood for and made mistakes on the date and didn't dress exactly the way that you would like him to and didn't talk exactly in the language that you want him to and didn't always open the door so nicely like a mensch, the way that you expect your husband to do, you should know that he is unpolished and he is not perfect because like the Torah tells us, It is not good for a man to be by himself which means you are looking at a 19, 20, 21, 22 year old boy that has lived his life by himself. You expect him to be good? You expect him to be perfect? You expect him to be polished in everything that he does? The Torah says, not good to be by yourself. You need an Eshet Chayot. You need a wife that's going to encourage you. You need a wife that's going to tell you how wonderful you are. You need a wife who's going to end up cleaning you up before you leave the house and make sure that your tie looks the right way. You need a wife that teaches you how to speak English so she can understand you. Like the Gemara tells us, Matzah Isha, 
Matzatayf. When a man finds a good woman, he finds goodness. There was once a couple in Klal Yisrael that was the most unlikely of people to get married. His name was Akiva and her name was Rachel. Anybody ever heard of this story before? A shepherd boy named Akiva who didn't know Aleph, Bet, nothing. And Rachel who came from the most rich family in all of Yushalayim at the time. And she was cultured and she was refined and she was bright and she was sharp. But she looked at Rabbi Akiva and she didn't see the Akiva that was in front of her. She saw the potential in who Rebbe Akiva could be. And she looked past him being a shepherd. And she looked past his sandals. And she looked past his beard that was probably didn't look so nice. She looked past all of that and she looked inside of him. And she saw the great potential that existed in him. And they go down in history as being one of the most legendary couples of all time in Klal Yisrael. He became the leader of the Jewish people because he had a wife who saw the good and believed in him. If you are expecting a young man in yeshiva to be perfect, to be a tzaddik, to be so refined, and so amazing, and so sensitive to all of your needs, you are in the wrong religion. Because he does not exist. He is a work in progress, just like, ladies, I hate to tell you, you are also a work in progress. You are not perfect. You are not at tzaddikis. You're I mean, at your Sheva Brachas, they will say, she's the biggest tzaddika in the whole world. Okay, save that for the darshan in my Sheva Brachas. But you are also growing. You are also changing. You are also trying to make new heights in your avodas Hashem, in your midot, in your character. Make yourself a better person. So why are you expecting that the young man that's sitting across the table from you at the at the uh, hotel lobby, and he keeps getting distracted by everything. The guy's been sitting in a base midrash for like six years, and now you bring him to a hotel lobby in Manhattan, and you want the guy just to sit there and stare at you? When there's so much going on all around him? First of all, the guys are not gonna stare at the girls the whole night. We learned in yeshiva for so many years, you can't do such a thing. Second of all, there's too much going on in that, in that hotel lobby. So you have to have Patience. You have to have understanding. You have to have a, a, a reality of who it is that you are dating and say, I'm not looking for perfection, but I'm looking for someone that is striving to grow and become a better person. That you could see. If you see that inside the young man, if you hear his aspirations and the goals that he has in life, if he tells you stories about himself and you like the stories that you hear, even though that he's not yet a Rosh Hashiva, he's not yet the Gadol Ador, he's not yet the most perfect Balabayit in the world who's going to wake up early every single morning and go to Shul and Davin and learn and everything and get stuck up perfectly. But he's growing, he's striving. He's trying and he talks about it. You need to look past the exterior and the imperfections and you need to see what he actually has and can offer you on the inside. I know a couple, happened to be that they are Persian. They started dating and the girl was much more religious than the boy. Very common thing that goes on these days. Sometimes it works beautifully. Sometimes it fails miserably. So be careful. In this particular story, the couple was going out and the boy was really not holding by religion very strong. The girl grew up in the Shomer Shabbat house, 
kashrut, she went to seminary, she wanted to live a Torah life, she wanted to have a bayit lema v'yisrael. This boy was just, just, just getting interested in Yiddishkeit. But she was head over heels for him because she saw deeper behind the no kippah, behind the jeans, behind the t-shirt, she saw inside is a great neshama. So this story goes back, must be over 10 years ago. We had at the time staying in our house a very big tzaddik, whose name was Chaim Halpern. He was one of the Rosh Yeshivas in France, in the Navardic Yeshivas. He survived the Holocaust, 16 concentration camps. He was a tzaddik like you can't imagine. One of the happiest people I ever met, filled with life and amuna. So this girl was coming and asking Rabbi Halpern for advice. She told him, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do this. And Rabbi Halpern says, I'd like to meet the young man. You like him? Yes. You want to marry him? I might. Let me meet him. So I can never forget this. It took place in my kitchen. He's sitting, Rabbi Halpern, old man, white beard, big yarmulke, piercing blue eyes, sitting in the seat. And this young lady walks in with her to-be chosen. But they weren't engaged yet. And the guy walks in to meet a tzaddik without a kippah on his head. Could you imagine such a thing? What is that busha? What an embarrassment! You're bringing the guy to meet the rabbi, he's going to give you the bracha, you're not even wearing a kippah. He walks in, he smiles. The happens, smiles at him. Sit down. They start talking, they start schmoozing. The girl's there, she's got these googly eyes watching the whole conversation go on. Rabbi Halpern is talking to the young man. At the end, after about 15, 20 minutes, he turns to the young lady and says, you can marry him. You can have a very happy life together. They got married. We're talking about 10, 12 years ago. Their chasana was something that I will never forget. And they have lived a life. She took him out of Los Angeles. She brought him to Eretz Yisrael after the wedding. He was supposed to go six months to see what Kolel is like, what Yeshiva is like. They spent over three years in Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, learning in Kolel. Baruch Hashem, they raised two children in Eretz Yisrael. They came back to America. He got a job. He learns Torah every day. He wears a kippah now, of course, all the time. They have more children, a beautiful family, and they're a very happy, religious, satisfied couple. Because when she was dating him, she wasn't looking for perfection. She understood, you're not going to find a single guy that is perfect. You won't find a single guy that's like the greatest rabbi that you ever met before. You just will not find it. But you will find someone that has potential. And if you could be like a wife of a Rebbe Akiva, and you could see the potential that is in the prospective boy that you are sitting across from, and you can imagine in your mind's eye, what's he going to look like five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road? When I teach him how to, how to speak English and I can understand him a little bit better, you will see that the boys that you wrote off after the first time, suddenly you're giving them a chance. Another date, another date, another date, and the next thing you know, Mazel Tov. There's a story with the stipler. The stipler was the father of, of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. And an older boy came to me and says, Rebbe, I'm dating so many years. So many years, I can't find my wife. I dated this one and that one. 10, 20, 30, 40, even 100 girls. I can't find my wife. And the stifler says to the young man, you dated her already a long time ago, but you passed her up. Because you're looking for perfection. And you don't realize young people are far from perfect. So just like you want a young man to overlook your faults? You want a young man to overlook what you are lacking? You want a young man to overlook your imperfections? You have to be willing to overlook the imperfections. Um, again, if the guy's a serial killer, okay, don't overlook that, okay? Do not marry him. 
If he screams and he yells and he gets angry on every single date that you go on and he curses people out while he's driving down the street, you know what? You don't have to marry that person. But if he's a nice guy and you have actually a nice time, the first or second date, just that he doesn't... No just and no buts. Give it a chance because you never know who this boy is going to become. That's one thing that you have to keep in mind. Number two. A young lady has to be very honest with themselves. You all went, Baruch Hashem, like I said, wonderful schools. Many of you probably learned in Beis Yaakov, you went to seminary in Eretz Yisrael. And everybody knows the goal in life is to marry a young man that's going to learn till he's 120 years old. And you are going to work 17 jobs and you will never sleep. And then you will do the laundry and you will cook all the meals and you will take out the trash also because chas v'chalila motzi shabbat, the man should take out the trash. He has to go back to the base mission to learn. And you'll have 72 children on top of everything and you'll hold them all in your arms and it'll be an amazing life. That's what the life of a Jewish woman is all about. And you've been drilled at this message since you are young girls in elementary school, in high school, when you went to seminary. You know what we say about the girls that marry boys that are working. <sighs> that, you know what they say. That's second rate. Of course, when the Menayal or the Rosh Hashiva needs to pay the bills of all of his Rebbeim, then ha ha, I love the Balabatim. We give them so much kavod and we respect them and we love them. Can I get another check to pay the bills? Sure, Balabatim, they're the best part of Klal Yisrael. But you should never marry one. Because you have to marry someone who's sitting and learning in Koilo. And if you don't, nebuch, maybe I won't come to the Chasana. Uh, don't give me a brach under that chuppah, please, because you married someone who's going to go to going to go to college, I can't even believe what am I, okay, now, know yourself, maybe, that is your passion, maybe that is your dream, since you're a little girl, and you saw pictures of all the G'dayla Yisrael, and you saw the great Rebetzins in your life, who supported their husbands in learning, from the beginning until the end, and maybe you read a book once that inspired you so much about what it's like to be the wife of a big Talmud Chachim. And even though you have to be Moise Nefesh, take care of the kids, don't see them all the time. You said, that's the life that I want because nothing is greater than Torah. If that's your passion, and that's your dream, and that's what you want, then don't give it up. Because if that's the main thing that you're looking for, probably you won't be happy with something else. We had a girl in our community. She was getting older and older and older. She was getting, as she got older, people said, you know, you know, Shprinza, okay, when you were 19 years old, you want a boy to sit and learn and call well, Okay, fine. 21 years old, you want a boy to sit and learn and call well, Fine. 23, uh, okay. You're 26 years old already. You want a guy that's going to sit and learn for the rest of his life? You know, get... Oh, just become a little bit more open-minded. They had a guy who's going to work. They had a guy who's in school already. They had a guy that's learning half time, working half time. Don't have this dream. She said, no, I only want one thing. I want a boy who's going to learn. That's all that I want. I'm not interested in anything else. And she held to her guns. And eventually a boy, I'm telling you, like dropped out of, from, from the heavens. And they end up going out. And the rest is history. They are married happily ever after, learning in Kol already 10 years in Eretz Yisrael, raising a beautiful, magnificent family. But if that's not really your passion and your dream, <coughs> and that's not really what you're thinking about all day long, the husband who will be the Tamil Chacham, who will be learning all the time, and I'm willing to live a life in a small apartment and have barely uh, money to go to Estes, not even for a pair of stockings. So then why are you fooling yourself? So that when you sit down with the shakr, says, so what are you looking for, working or learning? Oh, we're, uh, learning, learning, I'm looking for a learner. Learner and earn, not an earner, no, no, not an earner. My father will pay all the bills, of course. Why are you saying something that's not deep in your heart? 
Why are you trying to be someone that you are not? There's nothing wrong with a young man who doesn't sit in the base Hamidrash all day long. There's nothing wrong with a young man that is going to school and he says, I want to take the achrai, the responsibility to raise my family and pay all the bills and make sure that I can send them all to school until Mashiach will come. What's wrong with that? I'll wake up early in the morning, I'll dive in shachris, I'll go to a shir and I'll learn. I'll come, I'll do a whole day's of work, I'll come home at night, I'll eat dinner, we'll do homework, and I'll go back and learn another shir. What's wrong with that? Everybody has to know, what is your dream? What is your passion? What kind of a house? What kind of a husband? What do you think you can handle? Some girls need a little bit more gashmias. So then a cola life might not be exactly what you're looking for. Some girls don't want the gashmias. Some girls only want the Torah. So that's what you're looking for. But everybody has to know themselves. Don't try to date as someone that you're not. Because if you do, you'll never find what you're really looking for. Now on top of that, none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. We all have things that we are working on. And sometimes the reason that HaKadosh Baruch delays the Shirach is because personally we are not ready to get married. We think that we are ready. We went through school. We went to seminary. That's the plan. Go to school, go to seminary, come home. If you don't get married on the plane ride back from Eretz Yisrael, at least within a week or two you'll be a, a cop. <coughs> but who says you're ready? How do you know? How do you know that your midot are the way they should look for a kala? How do you know that maybe you're too angry, maybe you're too strict, maybe you're too unforgiving, maybe you're too lazy, maybe you're too sloppy? Could you know, do you know what it's like, ladies, if you're like a slobby wife? Do you know what it's like to be a messy wife? Your husband is messy. You cannot afford that both of you be messy. I remember when I first got married, so my mother once came to visit us in our apartment in Baltimore. And uh, I was a Bachar Yeshiva many years. So the way that Bachar work is, you take off your jacket, you just throw it down wherever you want. <laughs> so my, wife, my mother is at our house, and I came home from Koilo, and I take off my jacket, and I throw it down on the couch. And my mother goes, and she picks it up, and she says, you're married now. You don't do that anymore. And she puts it over the chair, and she says, Put it in a nice place. How do you know that you could run a house perfectly? I mean, you want the perfect husband, right? So he'll be perfect. How do you know that you could run a house with the laundry and the food and the shopping and everything in order and everything neat? Maybe you need to go to some organizing classes. Take a look at your room when you go home tonight and ask yourself, hmm, what would my husband say if he walked into our room and it looked like a cyclone took it over like my room looks like? What about all of the mental health? There's a lot of anxiety that is in the world today. There's a lot of sadness that's in the world today. There's a lot of, uh, of confusion in the world today. Are you secure with yourself. Are you relaxed? Are you calm? Are you happy? You know that every guy is looking for like a bubbly girl. Bubbly, that's what they say. She should be happy and positive and upbeat. Are you happy and positive and upbeat? If you are, Ashrech, fortunate are you. If you are not, there's pills you can take that will make you happy all the time. <laughs> And if you want to take pills, go speak to the therapist and work it out. And learn how to be a person who's not anxious, who's not unhappy, who's upbeat, who is positive. The reason that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sometimes delays our Shaduchim is because Haskein Atzmecha, you must prepare yourself. How to prepare ourselves? Number one, we have to be realistic about what we are looking for. 
We have to have, see the good in the boy that is sitting in front of us to see inside of him not just what we would like him to be. And we have to make sure that we ourselves have reached that place, reached that level where we are ready for matrimony, for marriage. And the, the fourth thing, third thing, fourth thing, is that you sometimes have to be willing to go out on a limb. Which means you sometimes have to be willing to go beyond your comfort zone. Baruch Hashem, you all come from the beautiful city of Los Angeles, and it doesn't get better than Pico Robinson. This is like the epicenter of all the Kedusha, all of the happiness, all the Mishpachot, everything takes place, all the pizza, all the Lenny's Casitas, it all takes place right here in Pico Robinson. So many girls feel that the only way that I can actually get married is if I'm going to stay here in the holy Pico Robinson. And if a boy is out of town, if a boy is in yeshiva, if a boy is in school somewhere, then it must be that this is not the one for me. Because I'm only getting married if I'm going to be able to stay near Mama June, and Baba June, and June Street, whatever, you're going to live in all these places. And so you could have a wonderful boy. Happens to be that he's in school in Baltimore right now. Dental school. Very common thing that happens. He's in dental school in Baltimore right now. Two more years. Two years, you say to yourself, that's two years of snow, that's two years of being away, that's two years of, where am I going to go for my burrito? What am I going to do for two years in Baltimore? And so you tell the shachan, hmm, it's not for me. How do you know it's not for you? How do you know just because he has to spend the next two years in school, it's not for you? Maybe it's not a bad thing to actually start your life off away from your parents and your grandparents and your aunt and uncle and your great aunt and your great uncle and your sister and your brother-in-law and your cousins. and your Maybe it's actually healthy not to be with everybody hovering around you and starting out your life by yourself. But you have to be willing to take a chance. And you should know, this is what I, what I understand anyway, as much as the girls of Pico Robertson love Los Angeles and only dream of living in LA, the boys like it here even better. They're not gonna last in the cold of Baltimore. They won't last the winters of New York. They won't last with the humidity of Miami. They won't worry. They're not going to last for such a long time. Eventually, they're going to come back to Los Angeles and you will be here together with them. Whether you live next door to their parents or next to your parents, or you live in the basement of your parents' house because you're saving money until you can buy your own house, whatever you're going to do. Eventually, most likely, you'll all end up back here. And if he says no, you'll drag him here anyway, so you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> so be willing to take a chance. Now, before my next comment, I have to just give a hakdam, I have to give a preface. I love the Persian community. I love the Persians. I might be in Los Angeles, the Ashkenazi who loves the Persians more than anybody else. I came here to work with the Persians and I learned a lot of things over the years about Persian culture. So since that I'm an outsider looking in, you'll forgive me for saying the words that I'm about to say. And this is not for the girls. This is for the mothers. And if there's grandmothers here, it's even more so for you. Let go of your children. Let go. They're 19 years old, they're 20 years old, they're 21 years old, they are independent, you raised them all of your life, you did a wonderful job. And now it is time for them to get married and build their own house. Let go. Because when parents get in the way of shiduchim, 
A girl meets a wonderful boy. She thinks he's outstanding. He's incredible. It's exactly what she's looking for. And then the parents, uh, and, and what does he do? Uh, he's in the, you know, shmata business. He says, what? He sells clothes. Oh, Mama John. <laughs> clothes? That's for that family over there. I want a doctor. I want a lawyer. I want somebody who's making a lot of money. Who's going to pay for the chatuna? You know that I know a boy that after 15 years he's still paying off all of his debts from his wedding because his in-laws expected him to make this grand wedding and he was a simple guy working a simple job but he had to prove to his in-laws it was worthwhile to let the wife marry him even though he's not a doctor, he's not a lawyer, he's not a brain surgeon, he's not a millionaire. So I have to make a chasen that I go into debt for the rest of my life. If your daughter likes somebody and she sees the good in him, it doesn't matter what he does. Because if you call off this shidduch and you call off that shidduch and this one is not good enough for you. Wow, have I heard so many stories. The jawbone, I don't know, this is a whole thing. The Shirazi jawbone. Is such a thing? Can't go out with that guy because he has the Shirazi jawbone. The guy is at Sadiq Yusayroilam. The guy is learning in yeshiva. Unbelievable. He's got such good midas. But unfortunately he has the Shirazi jawbone. Nebuch. So now he cannot go and get married to your daughter. That's okay. He'll find somebody else. It's all okay. It's okay. He's from Tehran. <gasps> We're from Shiraz. We cannot marry somebody from Tehran. We can't do such a thing. That's the worst. We can't do such a thing. His father was probably the water carrier in the village over there. We're not going to marry to that family. Mothers, I'm making jokes, but I'm being so serious. I've seen so many girls get hurt because their mother and their father put the brakes on the shidduch because the boy and his family were not chashuv enough for our family. Not you're worried about your daughter. You're worried about our family. What will they say when our friends see the invitation? What will they see when they see the wedding? What are they, we're going to get married at Sportsman's Lodge instead of the Universal Hilton? <gasps> what will they say about us? Chas v'shalom. You can't think like that anymore. I want to tell you such a sad story. I know a girl, Persian family, not a coincidence. She's been dating probably for, I don't know, 10 years. She could, according to my wife and my calculations, she could have been married at least five, if not more times. There were five wonderful young men that she fell in love with, that she was ready to marry. And every time she brought them home to the parents, they found the psul, they found something wrong with him. He doesn't have a real job, and he's not a doctor, and he's not a lawyer, and this one is Ashkenazi, and this one is this, and blah, blah, blah. everything you could imagine, they found in the tzitzit of every one. When she started Shidduchim, she was a very firm girl, very religious. We're 10 years later right now. Not only is the girl no longer religious, she called my wife recently to ask, what do you think if I'm dating a goy? Is that a problem? This is a true story. Mothers, tell your husbands as well, let go. What's better? That your daughter should be miserable all by herself till she's 23, 24, 27, 30 years old? Or she should marry the guy that you weren't really thinking about. But he takes such good care of your daughter. And he makes her so happy. And they're so sweet together. And they're building a by Neman be Israel. And they're happy. And they have beautiful children. And he has a job. And he makes money. And they struggle together. But they love each other. And they appreciate each other. And they are becoming someone that is pleasurable in the eyes of Hashem. What's better? You tell me. 
Single until, I remember when I first came to L.A., this is when I really began to learn the culture. There used to be an organization, I don't know if it still exists, Chalkeinu, still around? Yes. Yes? Okay. So they asked me to come and speak to a, a gathering of older singles. That's what it was called, older singles. So I thought, older, oh, like 26, 27, okay. I walked into the room. And I don't think anybody was younger than about 49 years old. Wrinkles, white hair. And I remember the house where it was, the lady who looked like she was probably 40-something, still living with Mama Jun and Baba Jun. You don't hear the problem with that? Let go of your kids. Let them walk their own path. Of course, if something is really wrong, there's a lot of red flags, it doesn't look good, he looks like a mean person, yeah, okay, fine. But if he's not a doctor, he's not a lawyer, but he's a good person. He doesn't have a million dollars in the bank and he might never ever have a million dollars in the bank, but he's a good person. And your daughter smiles when she walks into the house with him and she comes back from a shidduch and she's, he's so funny, he's so loving, he's so warm, we had such a good time together. Why are you stopping it? So she can stay single for another five years? Then she gets a bad name and she do him also. She's so hard to please. No matter whatever happens, it's never ever good enough. So that's my gentle rebuke to the Persian community tonight. You'll see, you'll make Shaduchim so much faster. And your kids won't have these, the kids get very resentful of their parents, by the way. When a parent cuts off one shidduch and then another one and another one, the kids are very upset with their parents. You want your children to love you. You want them to adore you. You want them to look forward to coming and sharing the good news of who they're dating. Not to do something behind your back and say, by the way, I just came back from Las Vegas, I'm married. No, you don't want to hear that. (coughs) You want to hear that together you welcome this young man into your house. So that's the message to the parents. Lastly, you have the, the, the girls. You have to learn, it's called, you have to learn to trust your gut. You know what I mean? What you trust your gut? Trust your feeling that you have inside. If you're dating somebody, and you really feel like it's going well, even though there are naysayers that are around you, even though that they say, well, you know, not this and not that, but you trust your gut and your gut is telling you, I think this is the one, you could trust yourself over trusting somebody else. If you have mentors in your life, whether it's your parents, whether it is your rebellion, whether it's a Rebetzin, whether it's a teacher that you had from your days in high school or seminary that you really trust and you value their opinion, whoever you ask advice for in Shidduchim, make sure their, your best interest is what their best interest is. Make sure that they know you, they understand you, they care about you, they want what is best for you, they're not going to let you walk down a slippery slope and make a mistake. And if you have people in your life that are just giving you bad advice all the time, that are just have their own agenda, that just want what they want, please, don't listen to those people because they are blocking what HaKadosh Baruch is trying to do, he's mezavig zivugim, he's busy making shidduchim, but we could block the shidduch chalila from taking place. Like the stipler said, you passed up your shidduch a long time ago. So learn how to hear your inner voice. Learn how to trust yourself. And also the same thing. If everyone else says, wow, it's amazing, it's great, he's the one. But there's something gnawing at you on the inside. And there's some red flag that nobody else sees besides you. And you know something is wrong. Don't allow yourself to be pushed into a place where you should not be pushed. I remember I was once at the Kaisal many, many years ago. I was still a Bach in Yeshiva. 
And a friend of mine had become, he had become a chassan, he got engaged. And within a few weeks of the engagement, the engagement it broke off, it didn't work out. And we were at the Kaisa on a Friday night, and you know, it's packed, you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people, and we just finished davening, and out from the distance we see one of our other friends from another yeshiva coming our way. Now this other guy did not know that my friend had a broken shidduch, all he knew was that he was a chassan, that he got engaged. So he comes running over, ah, Yossi, mazel tov, mazel tov, I'm so happy, and he's hugging him, ah, mazel tov. Uh, the, we bro- I broke off the shidduch. What? I broke off the shidduch. Oh! Baruch Hashem, it's so much better that way. It's much better when it happens before rather than after. And it's true, this guy, he broke it off. He got such a shidduch you can't even imagine. Don't allow yourself to be forced into a situation that you're going to come to regret down the road. Trust yourself. You know yourself. You're the one that's going to be married to him. You're the one that when they close the door at night, it's just you and him, nobody else around, just the two of you. Trust your gut feeling and know what is right and what is not going to work for you. And lastly, after the practical stuff, I want to just leave you off with one last idea. <clears throat> I remember myself, which is why I'm, I very much will run to speak at any Shidduch event. I myself took me a long time to get married. I was what was called in the yeshiva an altar bach. I was an older boy. All my friends my age and younger were getting married and I was getting older. They gave me a cane. That's how old I was getting in yeshiva. <laughs> and I got to a certain point where I was getting very uh, misyayish. I was getting very despondent. And I was despairing. I was wondering, am I ever going to find a shidduch? Am I ever going to get married? Everyone's getting married around me. Everybody. I went to so many weddings, so many vorts, so many. I was wondering, when will I dance at my own chasana? I called up my Rebbe in Eretz Yisrael, and I said, I need a segula. Now, this was before Rabbi Natanali was famous, so I couldn't get a segula from him. I said, I need a segula. Tell me something. What bracha can I do? What can I do to get myself a good shidduch? So he said, look, I'm a Talmud, I'm a student of Rav Shlomo Volbe, the great mashkiach in, in Eretz Yisrael. And he said over, there's three things that a person should do to get a shidduch. Number one, they should be mechazik, they should strengthen themselves in their Torah. They should strengthen themselves in their tefillah, in their davening. And they should strengthen themselves in their amunah, in their belief in Hashem. And when you strengthen yourself in those three areas, amuna, Torah, and tefillah, there is no greater segula than that to bring the shidduch that you're looking for. So he told me, a red ribbon around your wrist, not going to work. Go uh, get some bracha, might not work. But if you become a better person, and you grow yourself, and you elevate yourself, and you cling more to Hashem, that could work. So I remember this was right around Pesach time, and I did some very uh, courageous moves for an old man like myself in yeshiva. I went back two or three levels of shiurim to a Rebbe whose shir I really, really enjoyed so much more of Kalevsky's Atzal, and I went back to learn by him, I was in a room in the dormitories at the time that was not the best room in the world. There were a lot of things that were going on in there that I wasn't so comfortable with. I moved to the other dormitories, which are for the more nerdy kids, but it's okay. I wanted to be in a place of Kedusha. And I was mechazik. I strengthened myself as best I could in my davening and my emuna. This was Pesach time. On Erev Shavuot, I met my wife. On the, so the day before Shavuot, I met my wife for the first shidduch. And about three weeks, four weeks later, I was a chassan. Wow. And seven weeks later, I got married. Wow. And that was Bliya Hara a long time ago. 
If you are mechazik yourself, you will strengthen yourself. It's not like it was when you were in high school and when you were in seminary. You come back to Los Angeles, there's a lot that is going on over here. I cannot tell you how many girls call up and ask, Rabbi Horowitz, now that I'm no longer in Beis Yaakov and I'm no longer in seminary and I'm in the work world and da 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 what do you think? Should I get an iPhone or not get an iPhone? I said, I thought you had one when you were in high school. Why are you asking me now? She said, no, that was my sister. If you need one, if that's what your job requires from you, okay, who's going to tell you not to? But if you could still be mechazik yourself and not get engaged fully in the world of technology, even if you need one, so maybe you'll make sure you have a good filter. Maybe you get rid of some of those apps that are so distracting. How can you say to Hillim for 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes a day to find the shidduch when you're busy Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. A father came to me last year, and he says, Rebbe, help me. My son is addicted to tick-tock. I don't know what to do. I have a 13-year-old. He's addicted to tick-tock. So at that time, I was very uh, naive. I didn't really know what tick-tock was so much. So I said, can you explain it to me? He said, yes. And he goes through, he gives me a whole shear on tick-tock, explains the whole thing. And he talks about how, you know, it's pictures and, and you swipe like this and the deer running across the road and the dogs barking and the bunnies meow, whatever it is, and you see, whatever you like. So you keep doing whatever you like. They keep sending you pictures and it just goes on and on and on, nonsense for one hour at a time. Then the father looks at me and he says, and I don't know what to do because I'm also addicted to TikTok. So what does that mean? If you're addicted to these things, if this phone is always in your hand, if you're always looking online, you're looking at things, how do you have time to daven properly? How can you say extra to Hillel? How can you cry out to Hashem? How can you go to a shiur? There's so many shiurim in this town. This is Pico Robertson. It's, you know, it's like a, there's kolels and there's shuls and there's great tamil chachamim and there's rebbes that are giving shiurim. Who has time when you're busy on the phone? Be mechazek yourself. Be mechazek. Know how to turn it off. Know how to put it down. Know how to delete the apps that are on there. You'll be surprised how much siyat the shema you're going to get in your life when you delete an app that you really don't need that is just bothering and wasting your time. And also when you were in seminary, it was so easy to dive into Hashem. You had so much time in the world, all the time in the world. Here in LA, we're busy, 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 busy. Traffic and work, and some of you have two or three jobs, and you're stressed out about this. Who has time to dive in? But HaKadosh Baruch is waiting for your tefillahs. He's waiting for your prayers. He's waiting to hear what you have to say. I want to leave you off with one last story. A story of the power, the koyach tefillah. As many people say, I've been davening and davening and davening and davening. Hashem doesn't answer my, he doesn't answer my prayers. How do you know that you're davening hard enough? How do you know that you have let out of your heart from the deepest of places that one magical tefillah that a Kodesh Baruch is going to grab with his hands and send you the shirk that you're looking for? There was a couple in Eretz Yisrael, husband and a wife, they were married for 15 years, no children. Nobody should ever know such things. And they were distraught. And they were in a lot of pain. They went to the doctors. They went to the Gedol Yisrael. They got brachas. They went to Daven by the Kivrit Sadikim, the graves of Sadikim. And nothing worked. So this young man lived in a city called Ofakim. Ofakim is where Rav Shimshim Pinkas Zeichet Sadik Divracha lived. And while he was there, he decided one night to walk Rav Shimshim Pinkas home. And he begins pouring out his heart to the great Sadiq of Pinkas, and he says, 15 years, all of our family and our friends have children, and they're making bar mitzvahs, and we saw them move on to this stage in their life, and we have no children, we tried everything, we have no children. And he's walking with Rav Shem Pinkas up to his house, he doesn't even realize where he's walking. And Rav Shem Shem Pinkas says, come with me, he grabs his keys to his car, he says, come with me. 
And they go back down the stairs and they get into the car of Shimshon Pincus and they start driving. Now anybody who knows that area, it's the, it is the north where everything is, what took place on October 7th, it's, that's the north, right? Yeah. South, so it's the south. So it's a lot of open roads, and there's a lot of fields, and they're driving, it's nighttime, and as they're driving, Rav Shimshon Pinkus is listening to this man pour out his heart, and suddenly the man realizes they're in the middle of nowhere. And he pulls the car off to the side of the road, and he tells to the man, get out. And the man looks at Rav Shimshon Pinkus, and he says, look over there, can you see far away? He says, yes. You know what that is? No, he says, that's Ofakim, that's where we live. We're pretty far away, aren't we? He said, yes. He says, do you think that if you screamed in this place right now, anybody in Ofakim would hear you? Probably not. He says, look around where we are right now. Do you see anybody else here besides us? No, he says, I see nobody. So if you would scream right now, is anyone going to hear you? He said, no. And he looks at me and says, I want to tell you something. You are asking for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give you a child. He said, in order for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give you a child, you need a tefillah, you need a prayer that is coming from the bottom of your heart. A tefillah, a prayer that you never had before in your entire life. And he says, let me show you how to pray to Hashem. And Rav Shem Shem is a big man with a large, loud, bellowing voice. And there in the middle of this empty area, he screams out, Tati! Abba! And his voice is echoing along the mountains. And he screams again, Tati! And his voice is just echoing and echoing and echoing. And he turns to the man and he says, When you call out to your Father in heaven like that, then HaKadosh Baruch is going to answer you. I'll see you later. And he gets into his car and he drives away. And he leaves the man standing on the side of the road. Of Shimshin Pinkus just drove away and he's all by himself. And he realizes that Rav Shimshin Pinkus wants him to daven like he never davened before. So he starts davening and davening and calling out to Hashem and davening. And about a half an hour later, Rav Shimshin Pinkus pulls back up in his car and he gets out of the car and he walks over to the fellow who's there standing there davening and he looks in his eyes and he says, Nope, you didn't do it. I'll be back. And he gets into his car and he drives off again. And he goes away for another half an hour and the man this time is davening, Please, Hashem, we want children. Save us, we want children. And the Pincus comes back a half an hour later. And he pulls the car up and he gets out of the car. And he walks over to the young man and he looks deep in his eyes and he says, You didn't do it yet. Call out to the Rebbein Nishayla from the bottom of your heart. Tell him what you want. And he gets back in the car and he drives away. And the man this time begins crying out like he never davened in his life. And about a half an hour later, Rav Shimshin Pinkus comes back. And the man is standing there. His eyes are all puffy. Tears coming down his face. His cheeks are all wet with tears. It's in his beard. And Rav Shimshin Pinkus gets out of the car. And he walks over to the man. And he looks deep into his eyes. And he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu heard your tefillahs. You're going to have a child. And about 10 months later, this man and his wife welcomed a healthy baby into this world. Wow. Maybe you all have to take a trip to the mountains, somewhere around here, a park when nobody else is around, or go into your basement or somewhere and cry out to Hashem from the bottom of your heart and ask the Rebbein Shalom, remember, what's Hashem busy doing since He finished creating the world? Mezaveg zivugim. That means you're on His mind. Your chasen is already written on a list. 
You just have to get to him. He has to get to you. What's going to be the thing? When you let out those prayers in a way that you never davened before in your entire life. So in Yitz Hashem, as you continue to sing the praises of Nishmas, Kel Chai, you sing out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you praise Hashem, you thank Hashem. One of the great psukim over there is how much you have to thank the Rebbein Hashem, even if you're not yet a Kala, even if He dumped you after nine dates, even if He broke the Shidduch, even if it didn't work out, thank the Rebbein Hashem, because everything that He does is good. And when a person davens, and they cry out like that, and the Mechazik and the Amuna, and they believe in that, then just as Hashem has been busy for 5,784 years making the most beautiful Shidduchim in Klal Yisrael, you can be guaranteed He's going to make your Shidduch as well. Bezrat Hashem, like we said in the beginning, Beshat Tova, Omatzlachat Bezrat Hashem.